Everybody, P.A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Back from the road trip, back to doing full production on the shows, back to getting back to it. And uh, look, I, I love it. First off, a little piece of advice. As a guy that just went through a whole bunch of countries on two different road trips and went camping in the eastern Sierras from jail, July 24th until August 15th, you know, technically the 16th, let me just say this. Get out and go see your country. Whatever country you're in, wherever you're listening from, get out and go see it. Get off the road, get off the beaten path, and just get out and go experience the people and the places and the things that are out there. Your life will definitely improve. You don't have to spend a lot of money. I, I certainly didn't. But get out there and go do it. Hey, I hooked up with a buddy of mine that I hadn't seen in years, and I wanted to make sure that he and I got a chance to get together. So out of the blue, uh, I'm able to get a hold of him like a shot of like a lightning bolt. and. I said, hey, where are you going? What are you doing? He's like, huh, I'm driving. And I'm like, I'm driving. And he's like, well, where are you driving from? And so I said, I'm driving from Houston to Kentucky. And he's like, well, I'm driving from Kentucky to Dallas. Holy shit. So I was about to go talk to Chris Thomas King. That show will come out later this week. But one of the things that was amazing about this was we literally had Memphis as our next big waypoint after, um, you know, after he did something, I did something. And so we met up that night, late, late, late in the night in Memphis. And it was great. He and I both deployed to Afghanistan. We both understand the game at a level that most people don't ever get to. As you guys know, I believe in the ground truth. John is a, as a fellow disciple of the ground truth. And well, I got him on the show because it's timely. It's important to talk about these things, especially when we're trying to understand Afghanistan in the now rearview mirror, especially as we live through the car crash that was created by the United States for everybody who is dealing with Afghanistan because it turns out it was a coalition of countries. Anyhow, to look at this and understand it and understand what happened so that hopefully we don't get into these things again, it's not just Afghanistan in general. We approach all of our problems that way. We look at Afghanistan like it's unsolvable, but the reality is, is that we are the problem. And so John and I, John Green and I get into this whole thing. So here comes a really neat episode. You're going to learn a lot about the ground. And then John's going to come back. I want to talk specifically about him in about two weeks. So he'll be back for more. And you guys are going to be fascinated by what he's gathered over the years. Do not miss these episodes. This stuff applies, by the way, not only to combat, but to modern life. And so you'll be able to probably pull some things out. And I know you guys will dig it. Hey, thanks for everybody for checking out the show. Hank, thanks for letting me get on the road. Thanks for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks to everybody. Here comes John Green. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Yoga. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hi, my name's John Green, and uh, you guys are watching the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. All right, so here's the thing I want to ask you right from the top. Let's just start, we'll work our way back. What the hell just happened? You know, we, we decided to pull the plug, we decided to leave, and this went about as poorly. The, the example we all use is Saigon, right? And the boss, president says, it's not going to go down like that. Everybody calm down. And yet here we are. It's happened like that. Um, why did we get this so wrong on the exit strategy part? Um, I think it's just, it exemplifies a fundamental disconnect between the reality of uh, Western thinkers, American thinkers in particular, who are generations uh, they are they are generationally socio culturally separated from the less developed world, and that we have been deluding ourselves into believing that the rest of the world wants to be Western, when in fact there's a tremendous part of the world that doesn't want to be Western. And if you've ever been a person who's who's uh, I guess swam upstream and articulated the what we would call as the ground truth with regard to the failure of our policies resonating our progressive urban policies resonating with a rural conservative uh, political body or sociocultural body. If you swam upstream, they didn't want to listen to you. And so, uh, you know, the U.S. government functions on one year budgets and everything is budgeted year by year. And quite frankly, if you don't expend your resources, uh, like if you get a hundred bucks and you don't spend more than 97, you have a thing called growback. So if you only spend 96, in the next year, you ask for 100 because you didn't expend 
that 4% and 97 is the target market, they take a percent away. So you only get 99. So what happens is you get this sort of group think on the one hand, and then you just get a fundamental uh, detachment from reality vis-a-vis people being unwilling to accept that the rest of the world just isn't necessarily buying what we're peddling. Over. Yeah. Okay. So not buying what we're peddling. But still, I mean, we we were there for 20 years, literally with the mission of creating capacity. And, and I want to add this element in because this is important. We, we often lose sight of what the mission was going in. Um, our, our military brethren who, who want to go out and smash things, break things and leave are desperate for that fight. But the reality was, is we were a multinational coalition led by us, of course. But there were, I mean, how many countries have you experienced first? I know, I, I know you must can think, probably think of a dozen different countries. Romanians for me, uh, the French, over yeah. and over again, the Germans, they were all tasked with different elements of this project. So to say that we didn't go there for nation or more accurately state building is not true. So when we look at how long we were all there, sure, why the hell did it fall apart so fast? Well, you know, gosh, you're talking about a complex problem, right? Which doesn't have a simple solution. So yeah. we can talk about this for hours. Uh, y- most people who are experienced in this space will understand we've been there for 20 years. But the old adage is we've been there for 20 years, but one year at a time. In other words, we have a one year plan at a time. Um, and we have to transition from one unit or one element to another year element every year with regard to what our plan is. And so come the end of the day, it takes you 90 days to figure out what the Fuddruckers going on. It takes you 180 days to figure out who the people are and how to get things done. At two, the 270 day mark, you're actually making progress, but then you have to start to retrograde and get ready to go home. And so we do not have an institution in the U.S. government and m- many other countries do not that uh, is willing to say to its workers that, hey, you're now going to go to Afghanistan for five years and you're not coming home. Because that's how long it takes to create traction. That's how long it takes to build rapport with the partner that you're working with. Um, And so uh, we have fundamental flaw in our approach to how we're going to try to change uh, a space. Uh, We absolutely were nation building. You're spot on. I agree with you completely. We're trying to nation build. Uh, It's just that we lack we, we try to build human capacity, but we don't have the institutional tools and mechanisms through which to build that human capacity. Other countries have a very different perspective. I worked with Romanians, too, a lot of a lot of kind of former uh, Eastern Bloc nations, and they had fantastic advisors. They were great advisors because the truth of the matter is they were more their their sociocultural economic reality was a lot closer linked to that of the Afghans than was ours. They actually understood what it was like to be a policeman and not make enough money to take care of your family. And so you had to kind of create chai. You had to find ways to get a little extra money. Well, we in the United States call that corruption. It's not corruption. They don't make enough money to live. So in my line of work, we called it an informal tax. It's not corruption. It's an informal tax. Why? Because the very Afghan government itself did not ever figure out how to tax its body politic. Because it was or create an economy that it could tax because it was a rentier state and it got enough inputs from outside of the country to take care of the intelligentsia, to take care of the leadership and pass some money down to the people. So come the end of the day, the institutions we tried to create, we undermined by not forcing them to grow earlier rather than later. And I'll shut up now. Over. <laughs> I'll shut up. Over. John and I happened to meet up. This is this is how great getting on the road is. I, I was driving from Texas to Kentucky. I haven't talked to John in years. I think the last time we were together, John, was in San Francisco. And right, that's right. For a wedding, a, a yeah, wedding. Yeah. That's right. And and you happened to and we called because of a mutual friend, Jeff Russell, says, Yeah, John's back up on the radar. Give him a call. So I call you and I'm like, hey, I'm headed from uh from here to Baton Rouge to see Chris Thomas King, and then I'm headed up to Kentucky. And you're like, well, yeah. I also am heading from Kentucky this time to, to Texas. Yeah. And, and we both had a waypoint of Memphis. This is like miraculously uh, right. And then we had these conversations, and I wish we could have recorded them in real time because you're talking about all of these essence problems where we want to create capacity with the partner nations. We go out and we train desperately with, with uh, the soldiers, the, the border patrol. I mean, if you saw all the people nodding, if you guys saw how many different elements 
we trained with and partnered with constantly, you would be like, okay, yeah, this is going to hold. This is going to hold. This is going to work. The problem comes in, and I, I think you'll echo this, when you're going to go train the Afghan National um, Army, the ANA, sure. and, and you're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Um, and the sergeant major comes and he watches the training, and, and you're like, this is what we're going to do pre-route, and you build a little um, a little course and a little map thing, and, and the Afghans can perform these basic training tasks. And then that unit that trains them and that leaves, and there's never an escalation or an evaluation of, of higher, what we call in the Army, 10-level tasks. We never get above 10 level. And we actually train them on things that we actually never do. We never do sand tables prior to a, a, a patrol. Never, ever, ever. I've seen it happen once. And that's because there was a sergeant major there to make sure that we did it right. So these sand table things are basic things we train these people on. But we never got to the point where we were teaching them high-end things because we think they're stupid. And we treat them like they're stupid. And we have years of treating them like we're stupid and we have no institutional knowledge of how we've treated them two, three, four deployments before. And so there's, look, there is a disengagement. How long can you teach someone, John, like the most basic things before they're like, yeah, we got it. Yeah, before they zone out. On map. Yeah, before, yeah. They, before they zone out, right? Um, right. So, you, you know, you had this uh, great observation. This is tangential, but I'll come back to your point. You had this great observation, you know, but the green book, right? We all, mm-hmm. what people don't know is military advisors or people who are, working in that sort of space. We all have this little bitty kind of green book. I probably have about 7,000 of them laying around oh my here. God. In fact, I did. So uh, yeah, I'm looking at like five lined up from Afghanistan. Um, and you'll go into wherever the FUD broker you go and have a meeting and you get your little green book out and you write your notes down in it. And, uh, you know, and after several iterations of advisors or anthropologists or, you know, surveyors, whatever you want to get called, information collectors, intelligence collectors coming into the village. The Afghans are just waiting for you to pull your green book out, right? Because they've seen it 53 times before. And they're just, God, here's another green go with a green book. And uh, and the same thing is true with the soldiers, right? They get trained the same stuff again and again. And, and rather than doing an honest assessment of what these guys are capable of doing before we start to train, we just start making presumptions. And we build plans at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, right? build a plan at Fort Bragg yeah. based upon how we would train our guys, not how their guys need to get trained. We forget that they fought a protracted insurgency against the Soviet Union for a decade. Yeah. And when it comes to small arm tactics, squad level tactics, platoon level tactics, they kick their rear. They kick their rear in. And so rather than tapping into the OG, the old guy and going, hey, man, how did you dudes do this? And what do you guys do well? We try to, you know, cr- we try to recreate the U.S. Army. And uh, and so and then we we crawled a little. Right. Here's a sand table. Here's this. Here's that. But we never let them walk and we never let them run. Uh, we never really trusted them. I'll be honest. You know, there there are always exceptions to the rule. There are units that did better than others. But from a macro perspective, we uh, tended to not trust our partner. And uh, we train them and then we go back to our base. We didn't live with them till, you know, 10 years in. We weren't living with them unless you're special forces. We didn't live with our partner. Uh, so anyway, yeah, again, just we knew it all. And, you know, we tried to make them Americans. They weren't ready. They're not ready to be Americans. They're ready to be Afghans, dealing with Afghan problems in an Afghan way. And, you know, that this whole thing that this was the Taliban did not defeat uh, the Afghan government in the field. The Afghan population capitulated. The leaders, the elders got tired of the war. They didn't want any more of it. And they got tired of seeing their grandsons die. And they got tired of seeing their daughters, you know, and their sons get hurt and mortared and all that stuff. And when Trump said, hey, man, we're out, it just started the timeline ticking. And the old folks looked around and went, yeah, we're not doing another 20 years of this stuff, man. We're not going to fight your proxy war for you, West. And uh, and so they started cutting those deals, apparently 12 to 18 months ago. And the Department of State heard about it and the agency heard about it. And they told various administrations about it. And those administrations said, yeah, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be, apparently. And there it is. We have these assumptions as combatant commanders, you know, we will mass and we will push and we will encircle and then we will get the Taliban to surrender. 
You yeah. and I both know that's not possible because the Taliban yeah. won't do it. I, I sat on a little panel show that Glenn Beck hosts at his studio yeah. and he talked to me. He's like, why don't we just do that? And I'm like, yeah, but we can throw the party. But if no one comes, no one wants to come. Why on earth would you come? Right. Especially when. Right. Yeah. So 2011. I'm in the field talking to a farmer and, you know, these farmers are smart people. This guy literally has no electricity in his house. And he says to me, you know, why do we align with the Taliban? Well, they're from here. You know, Mullah Omar was born. You can drive there in 25 minutes. And he had his yeah. parent birth yeah. home. So they're from here. They are here. I am Taliban. I mean, he's like, and I'm not an active Taliban member or anything, but, but this is the community. He's like, and by the way, you guys are at the negotiation table right now. They're going to be part of the future government. This is in 2011, right? And this guy knows this. And sure enough, there's a headline two days later. You know, the Americans are, President Obama is, you know, negotiating with and this is not meant to be a political thing but it is a fact that a Taliban have been in negotiations with us on what it looks like to start being here forever yeah these farmers know how to survive and these are farmers in taliban country so you know we why would they why would the taliban fight this why would why wouldn't they just stay in the hills yeah no absolutely they can wait you out right they, they've done it before and, and they get to pick their time and place of fighting in general, they get to pay, pick their time and play, place of fighting. We have, you know, we overlay all of these, uh, all of these civilized layers of operations on top of what we do. You know, we have rules of engagement, and we have to follow those rules of engagement. And, you know, if you recall, you were there with me. You were there with me back in the day when uh, McChrystal came in. I think it was McChrystal. He came in and he said, "Hey, uh, no more night raids. No more night raids." Yeah. And so up until then, we could run operations at night and we own the night because we had a technological advantage. So yeah. we really did a technological advantage. We own the night and uh, we put SKT small kill teams out and those SKTs would go out. And if you got on the road between two o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning and you started digging on the side of the road, we whacked you. OK, and we kept the lines of communication open. We were able to move up and down those roads. Uh the Taliban was very, very clever, and they marshaled a lot of public sentiment on their behalf, and they created this campaign, and they went to Karzai, and they said, hey, bud, you know, we need, we need to work some stuff out, and if you ever want to have a future without, with your head on your shoulders, you need to, you know, kind of work with us. No more night raids. And so Karzai goes off to the U.S. government and says, no more night raids, and McChrystal says, no more night raids. And I can tell you, I can tell you, within 60 days, within 60 days, the opposition had emplaced IEDs along all of our MSRs, our major supply routes, all of them. We lost our freedom of movement, completely lost it. There's a place down in uh, Paktika, Paktika, not Paktia, Paktika called Waziqua. And uh, it's a little community and it had like a road in and a road out. And we called that the Island Republic of Waziqua because we had to fly there by helicopter. So the ANA held it off and once we, no more night raids, once they mined the road with IEDs, we couldn't drive up and down anymore. And so all I'm, all I'm illustrating is that they were very savvy about shaping the environment so that it, it was harder for us to operate because they knew it was going to be a death by a thousand cuts. They were just going to protract this thing and drag it out. And we would run out of, you know, democracies, four year election, Republican democracies. Every four right. years, you got a new, you got a new president running for office. And they knew that the Americans would get tired of it and lose focus. And we did. Got tired of spending money on it. So anyway, there you go. My book, That's part buddy of it. Eric Hunley is in the, uh, in the chat thread here. And he's talking sure. about training on Taliban techniques, uh, TTPs, and, and, and yeah. having to do that. These things were not a mystery to us, nor were they a mystery to the uh, yeah. ANA. We, we know yeah. this stuff, right? We know when they fight and we know where they go. The problem is, is... Yeah. If you cannot flush them out, if they won't show up for an ambush, if your planning for your ambush takes three weeks to get it up to the RSC level, which is like a, a division or higher level, yeah. to be able yeah. to bring the resources to go to where they are, um, yeah. which it, you can't reliably fight in the way you want to fight. And this is important, and I, I want to talk about this. So uh, from my point of view, my experience, there's at least five, maybe six major elements uh, militarily, which we we had the dominance, but we'd never ever won. We couldn't we couldn't make that Taliban show up reliably, unless they were digging a hole in the side of the road. We were never able to sweep down into the valley and circle. I mean, look how hard and how focused the Marines were on on doing that, and they never ran out of enemy to fight. Right, and this is the Marines. We dropped a Moab on these people. 
people. And we turned the corner 15 times, just kept turning the corner, the corner, trying to kill these guys, but it never happened. So militarily, we weren't able to do anything other than get them to not engage us. Yeah. And we weren't able to we weren't able to close with and destroy, which is the number one mission of all commanders. We have all these other social, cultural, political, religious, economic fights that we also lost. We lost every day the, uh, the and you know me, I talk about the affect over the effect. We lost these affect fights. We focused on things and put a lot of energy into things into like female empowerment, which I've peer reviewed, published on. And so we had these things that were in no way relevant to the very essence of what we had to do to stabilize this region. Is female empowerment important? Of course, right? But we can barely even have the conversation internally in the U.S. without picking a fight. So you look at all these distractions. We we aren't able to win militarily because you can't you can't dominate these people. Yes, you can say back in 2001 we should have lined them all up and pushed them straight out. But the thing is, is they could flood right into Pakistan. Yeah, that yeah Pakistan. yeah that's all these yeah. I'm shutting up. You go. No, 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 you're spot on, man. You're spot on. And, it, and it's a pipe dream to think that you could have uh, you could have shoved them back into Pakistan and, you know, somehow destroyed them as a fighting entity. Because the one thing that we're talking around, here's what we're talking around. Um, we keep giving examples of how the top. Ta- well, and we're calling them the Taliban. Right. But it's the Taliban. It's Hig. It's Haqqani. The legal term now is violent extremist organizations. That's the new right. legal term. So, so when we brief at the high level, it's like, so we have the VEO, so counter VEO. It's all this kind of stuff, right? Because anywho, it doesn't really matter. Point is, add, I want to add one element too. You also have yeah. the Talib, the single, the singular yes. Talib guy. Talib. He's owns, he owns the franchise for this valley, you know? Dude, dude I'm a Talib. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm just a student. Hey, man, I'm just a student, bro. But anyway... So, so you're spot on, but what we're talking around is commitment. You're talking around commitment. Why do they keep coming back? Why do they keep coming back? I mean, come on, man. You drop a Moab on them. They keep coming back. The Marines clear a valley. They keep coming back. We pushed them out of the country. They just hung out in Pakistan for a while and they came back. They come back because they believe. They believe in something, whatever that thing is, they believe in it. And part of our problem with the a and and the A&P and the ALP and all the other A stuff guys we created is those dudes, those dudes didn't believe. So, so I, I, I go on my rants, right? I was on my rant earlier in my academic ease where I said, uh, where I said, come the end of the day, we were pushing a, an urban progressive agenda in a rural conservative space and they weren't buying what we were peddling. What that really means is these guys have a philosophy, an ethics, an ethos, a morality, whether you like it or not, it's theirs and they are willing to die for it. They're willing to die for it. And the rank and file Afghan in that country who believes in in a more progressive worldview come the end of the day was not willing to die for it. They weren't. And when push came to shove and somebody said, hey, man, we're going to cut you a deal. You guys can go home and uh, we're going to give you 150 bucks. You put your civilians on and you can go home. They effing went home. And so so when we you you also were saying you also were saying uh, you also were saying, you know, what was the you had you had a really cool catch of the phrase. But come the end of the day, what, and it triggers things in my brain, right? And come the end of the day, uh, while the while the progressive Afghan was not willing to deep was not willing to die for this thing that we were peddling, um, in the end, I think the elders, having lived for forty years of this stuff, thirty years maybe, thirty years, forty yeah. years of this stuff, just said, "Uncle, uncle." And if you study counterinsurgency theory. You study it if the population is the center of gravity and you're supposed to win the population. Guess who just won the population, bro? Oh, boy. Yeah, that's the theory. Guess who won the population? So so now here's this is intellectually sexy stuff, too. We were talking about this on the phone earlier. Okay, so if the U.S. government wants to deal with an interim Afghan government and that interim Afghan government is led by, you know, whatever they're called, the Taliban. They're led by them. And those guys are violent extremist organizations. I, they're on the list. Okay, They're on the list as a VEO. And that means DOD can do certain to the things to them they cannot do to other people. 
Like we can blow them up on site. Okay, well, there's a federal law that says thou shalt not render material aid and support to a violent extremist organization. So if the U.S. government continues to fund U.S. Prog- U.S. aid programs in Afghanistan, is the, US aid, is the U.S. government now rendering material aid and support to a violent extremist organization? Or at what point in time do we say, no, that's the legitimate government, whether we like it or not, they're the legitimate government. And since they're legitimate, they got to come off the list. Intellectually sexy stuff, bro. Intellectually sexy stuff. There are so many things that I, I want to bring into yeah. this conversation because it's so easy just to take off in a direction. And have, what Sorry. Thing, a lot of, no, this is great. This is, I'm a male, is, so I have ADD, okay? Yeah, <laughs> this is fine. One of the things we have to understand is, is as a norm, I'll say this, you can say what you want to say. As a norm, 90 plus percent of people in the U.S. effort, and I'm going across the entire board here, had no yeah. idea what they were doing day to day to advance the strategic cause that we were trying to do. They yeah, got bless them. They, hey, they well, worked 50% hard. Of that 50% of that 90% didn't give a shit. Well, okay, fair enough, right? And 85% of that 90% believed they were doing the right thing. And, and look, we all Maybe. wanted to do great, right? I, I know I made mistakes and I learned to reduce my mistakes. And that's how I got so good at doing what I do. did. Yeah. But so many, so we had a commander come in, their job is to button up and get the hell out. And the lieutenant under him who's out in this remote area, you know, ultimately loses three dues to, to green on blue or blue on green violence, right? The Afghan, mm-hmm. Afghan service members killed American service members. And he yeah, said, yeah. you know what? I should have engaged the governor more like you guys told me to. Yeah, motherfucker, he should have, you know, but he knew better than us. Uh, and that was yeah. lieutenants, majors, that was general. I watched generals walk into these uh, spaces and be completely irrelevant. And these are generals. They had no idea. So one of the things I want to get into people's heads that they, they can't understand this is like, we had a district in Zabul called Khaki Afghan. And we just graded out on the map. <laughs> Gone. Doesn't exist. We can't go there. Nothing happens. Nothing right. changes there. Right? Denied area. Yeah, just uh, we can't go there. Uh, then they turned off Argandab, which is another two or three districts off the main route. <laughs> Wipe off the map like it doesn't exist. I know, I know, because yeah. I've lived it and I've seen it. It's right, deep, right. Deep. What they can't and then, wait, wait, and then you're not even supposed to talk about it. I don't know what you're right, talking right, about. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what you mean, man. And <laughs> <Yeah, laughs> this is also on the state department because they're the same way. They're like, no, right here in the uh, provincial yeah. capital, things are going great. Like, yeah, but you can't even yeah. go 20 miles of that direction, right? Yeah. So we have this yeah. thing. We lose sight of, especially when you get 05 and above, how rugged, how hard it is to move things. So if you have this central government that you're trying to establish a legitimate and you can't reliably provision out to okay. the outlying areas, there is no connection to the government. The only government okay, let me, connection is to yeah. the telephone. Yeah. Let me, let me, let me rant for a second. Please. The phrase central government kills me. So yeah. one of the reasons that, that the U S back in the day worked relatively well is we're a federal government. We have a lot of local control, a lot of local elections, The federal government has limited powers. And the truth of the matter is, back in 1787, the federal government didn't have the capacity to actually kind of micromanage things 500 miles away from the capital, wherever the hell that was. Um, But what we did in Afghanistan is, for some stupid reason, we created a central government and we ran everything through the central government rather than empowering people at the local level. So the very structure we selected set us up. Well, I'm not going to say it set us up for failure. It just didn't do us any favors. Because I don't want to jump go in, in your rant. I got to jump in your rant. And I got to provide some some go ahead. context. You hear these people talking today, even about how it's a representative government. The local <laughs> no. people did not elect their. No. We'll call them the county governor nor the state yeah. governor. They did elect these people. They were chosen for them. So it's yeah. not representative of anything. Yeah. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Rant continues. Absolutely. Please. Absolutely. So you know they had a weak king. All things considered, for a hundred years they had a weak king. I, I remember interviewing a guy in Ghazni, and Ghazni fell. You know, and when got when Ghazni fell a week ago, I was like, "It's over, right. game over." Right. I thought so. So what people don't know is Pete and I have been talking about creating a nonprofit organization to uh, get the family members of Afghan linguists who worked for us. You know, for God, they gave they you know they sacrificed everything for us. 
but a lot of their family members are not eligible for visas to come to the U.S. So we were talking about creating an NGO to help get these guys out, a nonprofit. So in the context of that, we were, I was saying, I think we got 90 days. I think we got, this is just like, you know, this is like, you know, guys, this is like a week ago. I think we got 90 days. Pete's like, nah, <laughs> no, nah, man, we ain't got 90 days. We might have, I don't know, maybe seven tops. Yeah. And I was like, no, Pete, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. We got 90 days, bro. We're going to be okay. Yeah. Was I effing wrong? So anyway, when Gosney went south, I was like, game over, man, because the U.S. government, what people don't know, in 2010 is they decided to put the entire Afghan National Army logistical hub in Ghazni, not in Kabul, but in Ghazni. And when it went down, I was like, well, there goes the resupply for the That's ANA. It. We're done. It's game over. Right. So, and of course, there was a bunch of other stuff going on anyway. But I was out and got this is my rant. I was out in Ghazni in 13, 2013, and I'm talking to dudes like I do. And I, and I usually, frequently I start with, so what was it like when? So what was it like when? So what was it like when the Soviets were? What was it like when? And I do comparison contrast, and it just gets stuff going, you know? And so I said, were you alive when the, to this one guy? Were you alive? A farmer? Farmer. Were you alive when the king was around? Yeah. Yeah, I was alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Man, did you ever see the, see the king? He goes, funny story. I did see the king. I was like, well, was there a parade? Did he like have a, a suit on? Was he in a Mercedes? What was it like? He goes, no, 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 no. He goes, what people don't know is the king used to dress up just like a merchant. And he would go out into the provinces and he would walk around, you know, he'd cruise around as a merchant. And people thought he was a rug seller. And he would just sit down and talk to people about what was life. And he was, we had like a little, little meeting of all the elders and not a shura, but we had a meeting of all the elders. And he was there and they were just talking. And he said, so, you know, what's the king done for you lately? And one guy goes, Love that question. You, know, you know, we never see the king. And if the king were to show up today, I would bleep him in the backside just like I would do my favorite donkey. And everybody laughed. And the king laughed. And then the king went away. And the king left him the hell alone. Because the moral of the story is he kind of ruled Kabul. And so long as they kissed the ring whenever he needed them to kiss the ring and showed up whenever he needed them, things were good. But he slowly, incrementally tried to make that place more progressive. You know, everybody sees the stupid photo of the three girls within the record shop. You know, oh, by the way, that was over on Embassy Row in Kabul. That was not out in Ghazni. That was not what? down in Roman. Okay. That was not in Lashkar Gah. <laughs> that was like a block away from the U.S. Embassy in the hip area. And uh, yet they say, oh, look at what Afghanistan was like. No, bro, that was not the standard rank and file kind of place. Although people were not wearing burqas because they were, relatively speaking, moderate. But anyway, yeah. So back in the day when they had a king, it wasn't a federal government, but they allowed local rule. We tried to create this monolithic state where everybody reported up. And in order to get anything done, you had to send it through 17 levels of change, change of command to get an approval to come back down which created this incredibly unresponsive governmental system that fundamentally failed people who were detached by time and distance from the capital, you know? And, oh, by the way, don't think the embassy people ever wanted to leave the cobble to go out to the middle of nowhere to see what it was really like. And don't think that reporters did it either. They hung out at the Serena hotel and gave their reports after talking to Afghans who spoke English, not Afghans who spoke Pashto. Yeah. And they'll, Tell so you like I visited the Rose Garden of Alexander. You don't understand. Oh, yeah. yeah, and, and literally talking like that. Yeah, yeah. right. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. They, cool. uh, if you were Good off time. the ring route, they thought you were. This is one hundred percent true. If you talk to a State Department person and you said, "Yeah, I'm going to go off the ring route about fifteen miles uh, north," yeah. they looked at you like you were insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. Well, like, hey, yeah, man. but that's where you have to go. That, that's where these motherfuckers work. You know. Hey, I had a job because the Department of State said it was it was too dangerous for Department of State people to leave the embassy. So, hey, you want me to go ask? I'll go ask questions for you. I'll go find out what's going on. You know, I got, I got no problem with that. Yeah, I, I always say uh, you can't presume to improve the condition of somebody or something that you refuse to understand. And this is that, that off the ring route problem. You have all of these people, even if you weren't the capital district and you were hey. east or west of that. You were irrelevant to the state. Department. That is 
that's the name of your book, Off the Ring Round. Oh, no, the actual name of it is is How to Win by Fucking Up Less. That's the 100%. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what was the, the old army phrase is, you know, hey, just suck less, man. Suck less. Yeah, just Every, suck less, man. Just suck less. Just suck less. So, when we look at these things, we, we don't get these outcomes that we want. We can see it now, right? But that was invisible, gosh, 10 days ago. We really yeah. thought, like these, I mean, and, and God bless those generals. They're awfully adorable. Like, this is the a a We've trained them for 20 years. They're a mighty fighting force. You don't have to. It wasn't true. It wasn't true. And, and even if they did, why would they fight? There's no, they don't trust their command. And like you said, multiple layers of bureaucracy. This is not how they work. And then, by the way, we, under, we undermine the bureaucracy ourselves because we don't partner vertically or um, in a matrix. So if yeah. I want to reach across the partner chain and I want to get over to this person who's in Kabul and say, hey, my partner's working on something. How do we, how do we make this government work? How do we spark the engine, prime the pump, and make those supplies flow? That's not possible. And so what happens is, is an American and this is, I followed this one time. I'm like, how does this work? Uh, our ANP, our police got into a firefight and they need to resupply. And I'm like, it's a great test of the government. Do we have a government that works? And the answer is no, not why you think. It didn't, the request didn't get killed or didn't get stolen. An American decided that our partner was corrupt and they kanked the request. <sighs> And, and, How do and you build a government if you wait? wait can't. So, so that was like a counter intel dude down at down at your level who kinked it. It was just an American, you know, American one each. Who who knows what it was, but just you know the partner guy. And he told me he didn't know who I was, right? And it wasn't my partner. I, I'm able to float up and around, so I float okay. over in his office. I got it. And I got it. And, and he just, it. he killed it on his own without making a phone call, without doing anything. And so you have this government that if it was able to work wasn't allowed to it got undermined to the detriment so, of everybody in that valley so a couple of things one i've lived that uh <laughs> ask me to come back around to driver's licenses in okay, a second. okay okay come, okay. come around to drive because i'm going to go somewhere else right now and that is uh you touched on another point earlier that is salient i'll use my phd word right salient point um and that is you're talking to a guy in a valley about you know how come you dudes continue to support them or why don't you turn them in or how come it's them, not us? And he goes, well, Hey man, you gotta understand they're my cousins, right? They're, we're all from the same neck of the woods. Uh, Mal Omar's born down the road. And so what you're talking about are, you know, is kinship, right? Kinship matters. Being related to people matters. Being from the same geography matters, right? Geography matters. And I used to have this shtick about Andy Griffith, right? Mayberry RFD. Andy was the sheriff and the justice of the peace. He was both in that neck of the woods where he knew everybody. He knew everybody. So he kind of, he already knew who was, had a still. He already knew who could play the guitar. He already knew who could do whatever. He was, to, he was connected in that community, right? And back in the day, when we created the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police, because we wanted them to be Western and we wanted them to be, you know, kind of, become the, the, we wanted a nation build. We said, we're not going to send Pashtun policemen into the Pashtun region. We're going to send Tajiks in because if the Pashtuns are there, they'll be corrupt. They'll be corrupt and they'll engage in, and they'll engage in bias against, you know, old family grudges and all kinds of stuff like that. And the same thing with the Afghan national army. So what we really did is we thought we deluded ourselves into believing that, that human nature or that, that education, training, and uh, all that sort of stuff could overcome human nature. And that might be true over multiple generations. But we were not, we didn't have, again, a 50-year plan. We had a series of one-year plans executed over a 20-year period of time. Yeah. And so the one, the strongest, the strongest connecting factor you can have in creating a movement, a movement in that space is family. If you get the family on board and you get the, the cousins on board and now you have the tribe on board and then you have the clan on board, you can get some stuff done. You get it done. The Taliban, that's how the Taliban work. But we were like, no, 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 no. We don't want Pashtuns down here. Actually, 
we're going to bring in a bunch of Tajik Dari speakers who can't speak the local language, and we're going to ask them to police uh, Kandahar. Yeah, that didn't work very well. But that's what we did because, you know, yeah. we know better. <laughs> and we got the idea. Now, coming back around to – I got to say one thing. I got to say one thing. Go ahead. And that Tajik guy knows he doesn't belong there. This is not his family. And he's terrified. And so when the AMP guy said, like, hey, man, you want to just yeah. cheap up this opium and just get hot right now? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know what? Yes. I can't sure. take the stress. No You're problem. In this, talk about a hostile work okay. environment. Why not get okay, high? So, well, look, Americans are not going to get this. They're just not going to get it. OK. Or most. We would have blended Pashtun, Tajik, Hazaran battalions, infantry battalions. Right. And we're. They're doing, we're out, we're, we're, this was in host, in host. So we're out in host on the pack quarter. And uh, like every Thursday night, I'm not making it up. We'd have four Pashtuns in a guard shack, sodomized a Tajik. And then the next week, three Tajiks would get together and they would do it to a Pashtun. People do not understand the level of separation between those ethnic groups. And they have, you know, back in the day, they may have fought the Soviets together, but after that time, they fought each other for control of Afghanistan. They have a lot of deep-seated grudges against each other. Um, they really do. You know, it took us from 1865 to 1917 to create, guess what, the Rainbow Division, to bring a northern unit and a southern unit back together again. That's how long it took us. Yeah. To bring people together deliberately to say, okay, the Civil War is dead and buried. Your grandfathers fought that war, but this is World War One. It's a brand new war, and we're coming back together again. So, but again, of course, you know, we're we're smarter than everybody else and we can accelerate the program. But back to your the American who killed it. No kidding. 2013, I'm in Kabul. I was a senior police advisor in Kabul in 13. Uh, my last army gig thing there. Uh so anyway, um, we have all these camps. We had a uh, new NKC, new Kabul compound. We had uh, Camp Phoenix. We had all kinds of places where we were relying on Afghan linguists and Afghan workers to clean the DFAC or you name it, whatever the hell they were doing. And everything's percolating along. And one day, suddenly, I get a call from this major general. And he's like, John, I got a problem. And I'm like, what's the problem, sir? He goes, well, counter intel has denied every Afghan worker the right to come on to the bases in uh, Kabul. And therefore, there's nobody at the defect. There's nobody filling up, you know, cleaning, cleaning stuff out. We have no linguists. We have no translators. We have no nothing. Something's happened. I need you to figure it out. And I was like, because I was kind of a fireman and I, and I knew people who knew people who robbed people. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll go figure it out. So I went over to counter into the counter intel place. I'll just call it that. And I went in and I said, blah, 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 here, blah, 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 what happened? Of course, they said, we don't know you, F off. I said, well, okay, you can call this general if you want to, or we can work this out together. I don't really care. You call the general. Be nice here. Right. Or we can just work it out. So they decided to work it out. And I said, well, okay, so what happened? And they said, well, every one of these guys has made a false official statement to get their work. They've all lied to get their work. And therefore, they're all a security risk, and we got to revamp this whole thing. And it was like this – it was this warrant officer, right? And I'm like, Chief, oh do you understand what no, you – No, he have? doesn't. And he goes, he goes, I don't really care. This is a national security issue. And it's and green on blue it started, right? And this is about green on blue and blah, 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 blah. And I went, okay, cool. What's your basis for doing this? And he said, well, this is the form they have to fill out in order to apply for a job. Right here, it says driver's license. And I went, yeah, that's cool, driver's license. And all of these driver's license numbers are fake. And I went, well, how do you know they're fake? And he said, well, I got with the Minister of Interior, and they say that none of these driver's licenses are good. And I went, so you believe the Minister of Interior? He goes, yes, I do. I know that guy, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, well, let me, let me just tell you how it works, Skip. There's no such thing as a driver's license in Afghanistan. Right. They don't exist. 
they don't have a trend. So what people don't know is I'm also a lawyer, right? I did this, got all this education and I take my little legal background and I usually apply it to problems. And I go, Hmm, what's the legal, what could be the, what could be the, the, the uh, grassroots problem here for this legal issue? So anyway, I explained that to him and he said, I don't believe you. And I went, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk off the base right now. And I want you to go with me. And he goes, Whoa, I'm not leaving the base. And I said, okay, look, I'll protect you. And we're going to go across the street and I'm going to get you an Afghan driver's license. And he goes, you can't do that. I said, yeah, I can. So we walked across. We actually got him to go across the street from Camp Phoenix. There's a little shop that's set up. It's got a little sign. that says Afghan driver's license here. You go in and you give them five bucks. They take a picture of you. They give you a number. They got a little computer. They got a little printer and they create Afghan driver's licenses. And they're right across the street from Phoenix. Because when we did the regressive analysis, what we learned was someone back when they created Phoenix in the day and they said, we got to hire civilians. They took an employee. I'm not kidding. They took an employee employment checklist from Andrews Air Force Base. We, we backtracked through and they took the heading off and they put on Camp Phoenix. And everything on that checklist you had to have. And one of the things, usually in the U.S., to get a job, you got to have a driver's license. So it said driver's license number. So I'm sure in 2004, a bunch of people went, man, how do I get a driver's license? And some sharp cat said, I'll make you one. (laughs) And he went across the street and he set up shop. And I talked to that guy. I had a conversation with him. I said, tell me how you started your business. And he literally goes, well, you know, everybody had to have a driver's license. (laughs) So I took all that information up to the general who was in charge at the time. I won't name him. And he just, he was chagrined. (laughs) <laughs> he was chagrined and we it took about 24 hours to do all this stuff and he overturned the policy and he said okay just take off the driver's license so they don't have to lie right and uh i had to t- i had to get a an affidavit from the minister of interior saying there was no such thing as a transportation code and there was no such thing as an afghan driver's license but they did have test carrots so, mm-hmm. so there you I, go. I, I, I want to Add to this, and I want to squarely point at those warrant officers, those counterintelligence warrant officers. And I can say this as, right. as a counterintelligence agent: you dumb motherfuckers, you guys have no idea what you're doing. You don't fire people off of camps in a counterinsurgency environment. I got fired by, by the way for doing this one time, John. And I was saying this to this team: if you go really? around camp to camp and firing all of this, I was out in Conor Province, right, a place. Conor, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these guys were. Going all around like Conor Jalal about that whole area because they had the magical machine that told you know told if you were telling lies and they said yeah but these guys are all tied to the Taliban and I'm like look around bro I'm tied to the Taliban I mean Everybody. come on and so yeah. here's the thing if you're a counterintelligence I'm again I'm talking right to you chief if you have a bunch of talent working on your camp you don't think you're supposed to be flipping these guys and running double and even possibly triple agent operations exactly come on I mean you've got access to these people you can and find a way to create an incentive. They've got ask us. They've got placement. Your job, you're not a cop. And and like you said, they did the stupid stuff in Iraq too, John. I'm sure you remember this. You're like, well, that's not sure. a legal national ID. I'm like, you know what? Sure. I do thinks so it is. He says it is good enough for me. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, I went to the training and it doesn't have the property. Who cares? Like I may not even know about, about that. You're talking yeah. about something from an actual government. This is not an actual yeah. government yet, right? It's it drives me crazy when people do this shit and they and they make it hard for everybody else to do their damn job because of something stupid like a damn you know everybody knows that a california election starts with an alpha or a, yeah. uh, a you know, an yeah. alphabetic character and you're like yeah who cares who cares you, you you can't make this stuff up no you, you can't, can't make it up it's like what what are you talking about driver right mean, driver's license. no it's and, and then no kidding that's a false official statement right and i'm like well right. Yeah, yeah, there are false official statements, and then there are false official statements. Right, right. The, uh, so, what anywho, the, I mean, when the dude is starving, and all he's got to do is have seven numbers and a letter and a piece of paper with a picture that's laminated, and mm-hmm. if you're dumb enough to buy it, so he can get a job, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna go. Okay, okay, we're gonna be all right on that one. But it was awesome, man. I just so many stories about stuff like that where there's this fundamental disconnect between. Right. Uh, what's happening on the ground yeah, and what we're trained. So Pete and I went, you guys don't know, Pete and I went through this same kind of series of training back in the day to do this thing called the human terrain program. And uh, 
it was really cool. It was like six months long. It was at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And, uh, and they wanted us to, they wanted to start us on the road to understanding culture in Afghanistan before we went downrange to kind of hopefully help commanders better understand what was going on in the environment. Um, and, uh, and I'm not pandering to Pete when I say he was excellent at this. Uh, he was one of our, one of the best dudes at eliciting information, uh, in a soft way from people that ended up being meaningful co- for commanders who had to make decisions with limited resources and when lives were at stake. And so Pete did a great job of that. People will never understand kind of his experience. I don't think, cause you can't really, you can't put it on a freaking resume, but, but we're going through this training and they, st- they were bringing all these Afghans in. This was in 2009 ish, 2008 or nine, somewhere around there. They're bringing all these Afghans in to teach us about Afghanistan. And the Afghans were all say 60 years old. And this was in 08. So they're all 60. And you start asking them questions about, well, you know, so uh, tell me about you, you know, doctor, professor, whatever we call them, ma'am. And they would go, well, my family, you know, my, my mother and my father were doctors and we were there and we were cousins to the king and the king fell and we left in 1973 uh, and we went to Italy and from Italy we went to Canada, Canada became the United States. And so we got this resonant story again and again and again of people who left Afghanistan in the 70s and maybe up to 81 when the Soviets showed up. They all got out. And so we started asking ourselves, you know, are we getting the worldview of Afghans who lived in Afghanistan before the Soviet occupation and before the internal struggle between uh, Afghans for control of their country? And the answer was yes. So DOD, Department of Defense, spent a ton of money training us on Afghan culture, but the people they brought in were, they were great people, and they sure as hell knew Afghanistan in 1975, but they didn't effing understand it in 2001, and they didn't understand it in 95, and they didn't understand it in 2004. So we had to go downrange and learn all this stuff the hard way. Uh, And then the Afghans who had been hired to teach us had been hired by people who went to Yale and Harvard and Stanford because they were considered to be the gringo or gringa subject matter experts on that space. And of course they had their friends. These were people who were friends with them because those professors were all 60 years old and they knew these people back in 1975 when they got high on the hippie highway with them. And that's how they ended up getting their jobs. So the U S you got to understand it's not the U S it's everybody. Humans push the easy button. If you're French and you're in Africa, and you want to do something in Chad, you work with a Chadanian who speaks French. If you're an American and you want to do something in Afghanistan, you do something with an Afghan who speaks English. And rarely do these people get up off their fannies and go out into onto the ring road and beyond the ring road to figure out what the Fuddruckers is actually going on. That just does not happen very often, bro. Uh, and so, I, all right, that's my rant. I got to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to bring in a couple of things you talked about, and again, we're trying to understand like why this fell apart so fast. So there's a program oh. that uh, you bring the Taliban in from the cold, right? Come on in, be part yeah. of the thing. And there's literally an American in charge of this program, and this person's a military person usually, and they they get to wear civilian clothes. Yeah, that person can can successfully navigate their entire deployment, get an atta boy or an atta lady, uh, yeah. and have not yeah, be turned, an girl. Mm-hmm. Right, and not a girl or not a boy, and not turn even a single Taliban fighter in and put through this process. And you go to the commander and you say, you have this program to bring in Taliban people that, you know, like, we should have a null value should alarm, alarm to all commanders. I'm like, well, they don't want to come in. Like, yeah, well, here's the problem. You're like, we're trying to create this better environment here. You have this program with money attached to it. No one's doing it. Do you understand the problem here? Nope, no problem. So there are so many times where, we have these systems that were supposed to be in place because back in wherever in Cambridge or in Harvard or wherever, yeah. like oh, you have all you have to do is incentivize good behavior and they'll come come down and do this thing. So, and this was across all lines of effort, across right. all disciplines. You had all these things that were supposed to be working. And one of the reasons why I was so successful was is that I could look at these systems and say, "You got a bad result here." I was Pete, Mister Bad News Pete. You know, like your police. Uh, have no connection to the people. Yes, they can all do uh, judo flips and give IDs, but no one's going oh, to call yeah. them ever, right? Yeah. yeah. So over and over 
over again. All of these systems were failing and we just went forward as if it wasn't. How in the world did we delude ourselves over and over again? How did we, I mean, I just heard a general on the news saying something like, no, oh, these guys are awesome fighters. They're warriors. You know, I'd take them to combat with me. But in reality, they're not in a real place. So, so that's like a two-part question. The first part of the question was, how did this happen so fast? Uh, and I'm, you know, I'll be honest, man, I was stunned. Yeah. Man, I was stunned at the rapidity of this. Again, two weeks ago, I thought, okay, we got 90 days. We can set some stuff up. We can help some people out. Um, and then, bam, seven days later, you know, game over. Game over. The more we learn, uh, so we're talking, you know, who's listening, that kind of thing. The more we learn, the more we realize the, uh, the Taliban, unlike the U.S. Department of State, which is in charge of diplomacy, this is their job. They're supposed to be diplomats. By law, they're diplomats. The Taliban has been diplomating their ass off for the past year and a half. They have been negotiating, cutting deals, engaged in conversations for a year and an effing half with great success, apparently. And now some guys are telling me, well, state knew and states told the current administration and they just said, yeah, we understand, but we don't care. This is going to be the outcome. We're not doing it anymore. Um, and did that start when Trump said we're out? Yes, no. Prob the answer probably is yes. And I'm not, this is not a political thing. We're not talking about political statements. We're just talking about the, the ground truth. When, when you, okay, when you work with a partner, when you're, when you're an outsider going into a space to work with a local partner to get them to buy into a Western value set, what most Americans don't realize is if you're with them three hours a day and you leave and go back to your fob, they are risking their life to pick you. They are risking their life to choose women's rights. They're risking their life to choose Republican democracy. They're risking their life to choose no poppies, no hash, no whatever the F. They risk it. So when, you, when, when the leader of your country says, we're out, you crush their spirit. You crush their morale. And you are no longer reliable and dependent. So what happened apparently is the Afghans, how did this happen so fast? The Afghans said, here's, well, here's what happened. They said the Americans are not reliable partners. That's right. The and Taliban right. is a more reliable partner. I can rely more on the Taliban. I can trust the Taliban more than I can the U.S. government or its agents and representatives. Put my lawyer hat on. As an agent yeah. of the U.S. government, when you're a lieutenant or a captain or a major or whatever the FUD record you are, they said, yeah, I think I'm going to go with my cousin down the road there, uh, who I really don't like, and uh, I'm just going to keep my daughter out of his way, and we're going to be cool. That's what they said. That's how much we sucked. Our efforts yeah. sucked so badly, they picked, they picked the Taliban to be a partner with rather than us. And now the Afghans in the cities are freaking the F out, right? Because they're in the cities. They're freaking the F out. It's like being in Washington, D.C. and having Kentucky show up, okay? Those guys, their brains are exploding, right? now. And the truth of the matter is the people from Kentucky, they're probably going to talk like this right here, and they're just going to kind of leave you alone. So long as you put your hijab on, you'll be okay. Don't put your hijab on, there's going to be problems. But anyway, that's the answer to the first part of the question. Uh, and I can't even remember for the life of me what the second part was because well, you have all these systems that aren't working in place, right? So the Taliban uh, recruiter guy trying to get them to come back in from the cold, he can literally do nothing the entire year and be like, hey, uh, performs Dude. above standard. Yeah, let's get you up to Colonel here. Dude. So, so, you know, the Brits did this. Other powers have done this for hundreds of years and been successful. And sadly for us, they call it colonialism. And, Right. Colonialism is an anathema. Is that the right word? Anathematic. Mm -hmm. It is. To our ethos. I get it. I'm cool. I'm cool with that. Um, but their method was, I mean, literally, you graduated from Oxford if you were a Brit, and they said, okay, you're going to the India Corps. You're leaving on Monday, and you really won't be back for 30 years. We recommend you find a wife, and you're moving over there. To make it work and good luck and uh, good luck. and so 
you can't expect a staff sergeant counterintelligence guy uh, who's been through one year of, you know, I don't know, what is it? Three months of boot camp, two, three months of boot camp, six months of training uh, to drop that guy down into Lashkar Ga and have them have an effing clue. Just doesn't work. We, we lack the institutional capacity to be successful in the source space when we have a protracted, a protracted low intensity conflict. So lick now it's lick, right? Low intensity conflict. So yeah, we got the name, the name right now. Now that's going to solve the problem because the name's there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no, we're just going to, no, here's the U S is going near peer, baby. We're not doing this. We're going near peer now. All our doctrine near peer. So we're not, it's just too hard. We're not doing that. Right. Yeah. That's it. It, there, yeah. Yeah. This is, that's going to work. For, so I believe completely that it was possible to get this right. Um, we didn't, and we didn't come close, mm. but there are certain things we could have done. So for example, if this is okay, and, and it's so hard to get right, because look how badly we failed and we're trying to bring gender and, and into so a you have complex hope. thing. Pete, well, Pete, I think it's hope. possible. Yes. Well, you know, I believe in people. I believe in people, right? Yeah. It, it is. So we have this. It is uh, possible. It's possible. But you, you're talking about a, you're talking about a ground up, restructuring, from the tactical yeah. to the strategic level, vis a vis how we frame the problem. How do we frame the problem? And right. honest discussions about what we are ethically willing to do to solve the problem. So, women's rights. You tell your story about the or your experience. Tell your experience with the farmer who said, "If you want my daughter to learn to read, this is what you got to do." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two farmers. There, there's, there's these two farmers, and they're and they're literally like next next door neighbors, right? And one guy's like, "Oh, my daughter, she has the radio. I have no control over it. She just this, this, she just does whatever she wants, you know." Yeah. And this guy's adorable, right? And and you love him and you love his love for his daughter. It's evident on his face. It translates over everything. The other guy's like, if my daughter touches that radio, I beat her. And he's not joking. He yeah. beats her. So you have next door neighbors that completely disagree on what's appropriate. And the and the radio is, yes, it has music on it, but also has prayers and it's information. It's all kinds of things. And this guy's like, you will not touch the radio, right? Yeah. And so when you go into this valley, if you don't have the ability to slow down and be deliberate and make a lot of mistakes, it, John, yeah. I know this is true for you. When I would go into a new area, especially, I'm like, I know nothing. Tabla rasa. Everything's gone. I don't know anything. I'm going to ask the basic questions. I would tell my interpreter, I'm going to ask questions that you know I know the answer to already. I don't care. Ask that yep. question. And I would get yeah, them no. in such a spell, they would be like, Pete, you already know. And I'm like, I know. And I want you to ask this question because I need to know how these guys answer this question. Exactly. Exactly. You know? I don't want to know how you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. And so we had this process and we it worked. People would explain the complexity of things. And what I always learned was there's, there's two things. You had to slow down. We had to fix our input, our our contribution to the instability. And if we couldn't do that, you can't reliably and repeatedly fix the other side of it because we are the bigger problem. Yeah, yeah, we're we're, uh, we're the earthquake that shows up, right? Oh, yeah, we talk about stability operations, and we are actually the earthquake. Because yeah, you know, can you imagine living in uh, La Jolla? Mm-hmm. And in La Jolla, you're kind of doing your own thing, right? And then uh, on Tuesday, the Mexican army shows up, and they put forty five hundred dudes down the street from you. Just bam, they're there, and they're building a base, and they set up checkpoints. And you want to drive on the highway and they stop you. You are the instability. You're the earthquake, man. Everything yep. you did, you're the earthquake. Right? Oh, and by the way, now they enter into a contract for, I don't know, bread. And they're going to buy a stock <laughs> of bread. And now you as a local can't get bread because your baker's selling all the stuff to the Mexican army because they pay a higher price than a civilian does. Oh, and now my price for bread's gone up. So you're spot on about us being the chief instabilitator it's a new word i just invented it uh, in a, yeah there's no doubt about it but i'm going to go back to the i'm going to go back to the uh the farmer can you i know, can i say one thing that, before we get past the uh the the, the sure. instability thing when sure. we look at these problems we're trying to create something and we're not there long enough that 21 year fight it's worse than that 
Because you get your one job and maybe you get good at it for three months and then you start to leave and then you never touch that job again. You're uh, an E4 out in the village walking around and you're not allowed to say anything. And then you become an E5 and you're running soldiers and then you're an E6 and you're um you know on staff and then and then and then so you can have 15 deployments and never learn a damn thing because you never had enough time to actually develop capacity so sure there's a reason why this system fails because i don't don't... know yeah i I hear you go ahead sorry yeah no no but you get where i'm going with that it's i I know where you're going with it and i think it matters and it doesn't matter and by that by that if i'm trying to crank out 500 dudes who can do this thing I need a training program that really will train them to do this thing. And then they need to be able to go do this thing. And that's how they get better at the thing. And that is institutionally how we would do it, right? That's how we create a tanker or a rifleman or an artillery guy or whatever the hell we're trying to create. So you're spot on. On the other hand, there are just some people who get it. And, you know, it's the art, right? They They just get it. And you can drop a battalion down and there would be people who would get it. For me, the problem isn't that we have a crummy training program or we have no training program. Uh, it is the one year tour. You got to stay for three, bro. You got to stay for three or you got to have like the, they have those submarines, which is blue gold. You're there for a year. You're home for a year. You're there for a year. You're home for yeah. a year. But, yeah. but with our current model for force generation and all that sort of stuff in the U S army and the DOD, it ain't working because we're all, wor- we're worried that people are going to quit. Hey man, we got retention. We got to have retention problems. So we have these, we have these first world recruiting and retention problems that the Afghan, that the Taliban doesn't have. Taliban ain't got that problem. Cause what they'll do is they'll go, Hey, Ahmed, uh, we're going to go do this thing tomorrow. And Ahmed will go, can't make that one. Got to harvest my poppies, but I can make the next one. And they'll go, okay, cool. So he like stays at home for a month and then he's part of the next deal and then he stays at home and he comes back and there's this loose affiliation and because they're present, they can kind of outlast us. But, you know, going back, shifting gears and going back around. So the point is, again, if we want to do this and do it well, which we yeah. don't, the U.S. government has no appetite for doing this well. They just don't. OK. And yeah, anyway, uh I talk to Congress people, senators. They just don't. If it gets them elected, they're happy, and then they just don't give an F. Anyway, uh, ha, it's pretty funny. Anyway, back to the girls. Let's talk about let's talk about women's rights. Uh, you had a conversation. I recall this. You had a conversation with those farmers, yeah. and you said, you know, well, what about the daughters? You know, what what can we do for daughters? And the one yeah. guy who loved his daughter said, if you want my daughter to be able to learn to read and write. You first need my son to learn to That's read. Right. And what he's getting at is this is generational. This is what I harp on. The one year tour suck. It's not going to work, right? It's a 50 year fight. This is at a minimum a 50 year fight. And if you're going to do one of these things, you got to agree somehow there's got to be structure where we're agreed that we're in for 50. We're in for 50. That's what we're in. And then the Taliban will just go, okay, cool. We just got to chill for 49 years. But yeah. anyway, you know, because action, reaction, counteraction. Right. Anyway, the moral of the story is you got to be in for 50. But it's a generational fight. And when you're dealing with a conservative rural community, see, I'm being politically correct whenever I use these phrases. When yes. you're dealing with conservative rural people, you got to convince. You're not convincing grandpa. It's too late. He either he's he has a worldview. You might convince the father one way or another, but the father's not going to assume risk for his kids on your behalf. He's not going to risk his kids' lives for you. We know about this with farming. We'll talk about farming later. So it's the it's the grandkids you want to convince, and you're going right. to convince them with this. Oh, yeah. This is the winner. Yeah. You give sure. them all one of these. This is the winner. They can learn to read and write on this. They can download apps on this. That's right. They can sneak peeks at all kinds of crap you want them to sneak peeks at with this. But it takes 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. And uh, you can't do it with a one-year budget. And DOD is like, man, I'm only budgeted for a year. So true story. Colonel, last name by the name of Brown. I will not say his first name. I first bumped, to him, bumped into him in uh, 05. And 05. I was like, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I am building schools. 
And I went, what? He goes, I'm building schools. Yeah. He was a, uh, he was a major. I'm building schools. Where? Everywhere. Why? Because I got a budget to build schools That's this right. year. He just threw schools down everywhere. Didn't care where they were. He didn't care if they built them on one side of the river, which actually caused the clan on the other side of the river to hate the clan on the side that got it, which created internal conflict. And they, oh, they could have found a spot where everybody mutually agreed to build this new. No. Oh, and by the way, since he built the school on one side, all the teachers came from the other side and they refused to cross the river to teach. Mm-hmm. So now we didn't have teachers, didn't do any of that kind of network. I'm building schools. So yeah. he built schools. I bumped into him in 10. He was a colonel by then. Got promoted, lieutenant colonel, colonel. And I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm closing schools. <laughs> he goes, closing schools. No oh. more money. Shut them off. Yeah. And I was like, do you? And I had a, I said, do you really care at all that back in the day you were building schools and now you're shutting them down? He goes, I don't give an F. Right. But can I retire in a year? Yeah, that's true. So there you and go. We built, we built that schools whether they wanted them or not. We never, asked. Right. we right. never said where should it be. We that's never right. ever cared. And we always put our our projects, our pet thing, female yeah. rights. Oh yeah. Ahead of whatever's possible there. Hey, what's possible here? And and, and one of the things Amen. in our paper is the commander's ethos undermines female engagement. The elders of that community, the tribal elders, they are the law. And if they aren't on board, you have no business engaging in female empowerment. And only right. when you've gone through this matrix and you it. understand yeah. what's possible, then no. you can engage females. But but we don't we don't do that. That's not what we, Congress wants to hear, bro. No. Congress no, no. wants to hear. Here, okay, how many times has this happened to you? Guys, guys, this is what happens. You're bopping down the bunny trail, minding your own business. You cruise through the embassy or you cruise through some headquarters by mistake. You never want to be there, but you cruise through by mistake. Uh, and you bump into the USA guy or girl and they go, hey, uh, I have $4.2 million that I have to obligate. That means they got to get a project on a piece of paper up in an Excel spreadsheet to high con saying they're going to do this thing to high command saying you're going to do it. I got $4.2 million and uh, I only have 90 days to spend it. Yeah. Can you tell me where to build X? Just whatever X is doesn't matter. And then you go, well, maybe you could get in a car, drive out and kind of look around and talk to some people. And then they're just, Oh no. I, yeah, I can't do that. You don't understand. Yeah, I can't yeah. do that. Just tell me where to do it. I could have <laughs> like, I could have put a hydroelectric dam in front of somebody's house in a desert and another one on the backside of their house in a desert and gotten both of them approved because aid was not going to go out and check and they had to obligate their money. And they were worried that if they did not obligate the $4.2 million in this fiscal year, in the next fiscal year, they'd ask for 20 and Congress would go, here's your 20 minus 4.2 million because yeah. you didn't spend the money we gave you last year, which means you're inefficient, means you're inefficient. So you need like a five year budget. So we have these we have structural problems, Pete. We call them structural problems. You need a five year budget or a 10 year. Yeah. budget. Yeah. Right. Here's your chunk. Go do what you want to do with it. Once you're out of it, you're out of it. So you better be clever. So, anyway. yeah. Well, so let me, I want to wrap this up so you don't have to do the whole night with me, but are you hopeful? Could we, look, if we don't go, we have to accept the cost of not going. Everybody thinks it's a free ride, right? So there's going to be human atrocity. Um, Syria is going to, you know, grind its humans into a pulp. And we have to look at that and say, we're not going. Not our job, not our mission, right? We have to be ready to do that. We have to be ready to accept that, that a festering pool of human hate might spawn somebody who decides to do something evil. And honestly, we got off pretty easy on 9-11. I mean, imagine if they were really crafty. Imagine imagine nowadays, if all you did is incite fear. Look how quickly our, our nation cracks. Yeah, wow, the tightest yeah. bit of discomfort and, and fear, right? Yeah. So are you hopeful that we can figure this out? And, and then maybe a better way to ask the question is, is, how often did you encounter someone like us at our level? Bill Mankins, Manny was great at this job, right? Yeah, Manny's the best. How many people do you need to put in theater? How many Bill Mankins, Pete Turners, and John Greens do you need to have in theater? If we, if we made you like, you know, you're, you're the, the pole ad with uh, the boss in, in Afghanistan. And we, by the way, we never identify these people. 
I would try to get a job. I would try to do things. They'd be like, who the fuck are you? Like, I'm the guy that knows warlords. That's why you don't know me. You know, I can bring people in onto the camp and blow your mind if you let me, but you don't. So we don't recognize these people. But how many Bill Mankins do we need? And is it even possible? Should we just not even do this stuff at all? What do you think? Uh, man, that's, that's a PhD dissertation in and of itself. Um, first of all, if it's su- not being a wonk, right? I hate wonks. Right. The bottom line is if it suits our national interest, we have to do it. Uh, and how do we decide that? That's fundamentally a political question, right? It's decided by whoever the hell's in charge. Um, so we have to be able to do this. We ha- so the, we call it the capability. We have to have this capability. Whether we use it or not, it's a different story. The degree to which we use it, we got to have the capability. Um, how many do you know? How many do I want to have? Of course, it's region specific. The truth of the matter is, you you learn a region, right? You you did Iraq and Afghanistan uh, from this perspective. So, but but and and there's there's crossover, right? There's theoretical yeah. crossover, but there's cultural nuance, and so the preference is that you specialize in a region, in a space that kind of thing. Right. Um, and so, you know, if I were, if I were King, I'm going to, I didn't not, I'm not effing kidding. You're going to run through every bleeping. We, we call things countries. That's how we break things down. You're going to break down every, every country on the planet and say, okay, now let's regionalize this thing. How many people do we need on a team to be able to respond, to be able to do this stuff? Let's project what our power is going to be. Because, you know, I'm a, that put my PMP hat on, right? And so how would we do this? Uh, and you're talking 500 to 1,500 humans who are fully employed, doing nothing but focusing on studying that space and not studying it, being in that space. Right. They go work out of the embassy. So, so most people don't know there are two types of – the planet's divided into two types of space. Title 10 space, which is oh the Department of Defense. Yes. And uh, space is controlled by the Department of State. And so these people have to park in those places and they have to get out and they have to build a human network of people that they can rely upon. They have to understand. They have to understand all the informal stuff. We're the informal guys. We're not the formal guys. We're the informal guys. And uh, and so I think we need what's called a constabulary force uh, of 50,000 people who are trained to function in that space and keep stability. So they're not soldiers and they're not policemen, but they're kind of a hybrid between the two. And Oh, by the way, they're really, they're willing to deploy for five years. Um, and the cost, all things considered, is not a lot of effing money. It's okay. Not, right. It's not a lot of effing money. And, uh, but it's, it's how you deal with low intensity conflict because look, us SOCOM special forces, they don't want to do this anymore. They, they don't, they want to, they want a near peer fight. <laughs> they want to do direct action, man. Yeah. They want yeah. you talk to the Vietnam guys and they're like, hey, bro, we are partner based. This is what we do. They want to do this. You talk to the 35, 45 year old guy. I, he just wants to shoot somebody in the face. Yeah. And so, you know, the the uh, SFAT program, it's Ugh. it's kind of they're good at training militaries how to do things. I don't know that they're that good in partner based operations with uh, with, in, you know, non militaries. We'll call it that for now. A non-approved Department of State partner is what we would call it. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we can do it. I think it would require an honest discussion that there's this gap. OK, there's a gap between near peer, full open warfare and conflict. OK, and and uh, and just Department of State operations, DOS, right. State Walker. There's this gap. And uh, the Army doesn't want to do this. The Marines don't want to do it. The Navy doesn't want to do it. I can tell you stories about them. Air Force doesn't want to do it. So I think you need something brand new. And that's all if they do. If we were did. better at it, they'd want to do it. If it meant getting promoted, they'd want to do it in a second, you know? Damn. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. One of the things that I think illustrates this best, and then I'm going to let you have the final word, is we spend more time, and this is 100% true, training soldier service members and I'll throw department of state in there because they're they're clowns in their own right but let's just stick with dod we spend more time training how to put on sunscreen than we do how to work with an interpreter at the professional level and it's 100 percent true you can't go out and engage people like we did and reliably get a positive you're you're spot on you're spot on you're exactly right so there's a thing called introduction to training so 
back in the day, one of the things I did is, well, anyway, I'm not going to go on a rant. So I'll just say there are different types of training. And one of the things is introduction to training. And what we do when it comes to working with a linguist or doing a a key leader engagement, now now it's just a leader engagement because key makes people feel bad that they're not a key leader. They were were all keys. It's like I got a whole ring of keys. That's right. So anyway, soldier-led. We went to soldier-led engagement, right? Because we don't want to make any feel bad. That's how woke we are. Anywho, uh, at best, you get introduction. You know, you would go through JRTC or whatever whatever platform you went through to mobilize and you'd spend maybe an hour. This is how you do a key leader engagement and take your notes and be nice. And maybe you got an hour of instruction and then you went out and you did a field exercise for four hours. And of that four hours, 35 minutes of it was a key leader engagement. So you're spot on. It's just a joke. Uh, well, and, and likely so, most people didn't even get to actually do a key leader engagement. They watched somebody else do yeah. it. And the person doing the training is not a master of key leader engagements. No, <laughs> no, he's Larry. I'm yeah. Staff Sergeant Johnson. I am oh, a well, field artillery guy, and but I'm here to be your trainer. That's right. who they are. That's exactly. I've never left the wire on a deployment. Yeah, they're just getting paid. <laughs> they're getting paid to do their job. They're going to do their job, and then they're going to go home and watch a football game. And this stuff's way too hard to, to treat like that. So listen, we're going to have John on again and, and talk more about like how he does his stuff uh, in a couple of weeks. I appreciate everybody coming on and hanging out, especially appreciate Dickie for all the fantastic engagement and the uh, and the bump on the Super Chat side. Thank you very much for that. God, God has mercy on them all. I know. Seriously. Yeah.